This is our uh, monthly Art Matters Art Talk, and usually we have an exhibiting artist that does the talk, but when we have a juried exhibition, we like our juror to come out and do the talk, uh, just to get a feel for their, think, their thought process as well as the work that they make. Uh, so I'm really excited to hear from Rachel Husu today. Uh, but my name is Corey Fry, I'm the Exhibitions Manager at the Delaplane Art Center. Uh, so good to have you all here. Um, if you're an artist that's in the Emerging Artist Exhibition, would you mind raising your hand just so we can see who's present? <laughs> Great. Well, thank you all for coming out. Um, I wanted to tell you a few things before we really get started, and that's that uh, you're sitting in our West Gallery, which is half of our Emerging Artist Exhibition. The other half, if you've wandered through the East Gallery, just through the... Uh, doorway in the brick wall there. You can check out the, the rest of the exhibition. Off to the side of that gallery is our side gallery, which is the Betty Awards exhibition. The Betty Awards is a high school program for Frederick County Public School students. Um, it's, an, it's a uh, juried and award-driven program, but it's a great opportunity for high school students to have uh, an exhibition opportunity to get a feel for what it's like to submit a proposal uh, of their work um, all the way down to taking a decent digital photograph of their work. Um, there's a great representation uh, from Frederick County Public Schools students in there, so check out the artwork there. There's two exhibitions on our second floor as well, so take some time on the second floor. In the hallway is uh, paintings by Jillian Collins, some great work. And then in our Moreland Gallery, just off of the hallway, is work by Nadia Steer, um, some sculptural work. So take some time, wander around the building. Uh, later on at 3 o'clock, we'll have Creative Outlet up there, which is an opportunity for uh, folks to make some stuff. And you can see the front desk staff about getting in up there. Uh, spend some time in our gift gallery, just all the stuff, you know. Check out our website, grab a magazine for classes. Um, summer camps, there's, there's just lots going on, coming exhibitions uh, and other art talks. So um, I wanted to say just a word about the Emerging Artist Exhibition. Uh, we, we recognized at the Delaplane a couple of years ago that we had programming geared specifically towards kids. Uh, we had Helen Smith classes and all of uh, summer camps, all of these different programs that were specific towards kids, and we were reaching that demographic with our programming. And we also, we also have a Creative Aging Month in June and July, which is, uh, we have our Over 70 show, which is artists that are over 70 years old can submit artwork for that show. And we also have our National Juried Exhibition, which honestly, most of the submissions that we get for our National Juried Exhibition tend to be artists that are over 30 years old. So there was like this gap in uh, our programming, uh, artistic voices that we weren't necessarily uh, catering to or providing an opportunity for. So that's why we developed the Emerging Artist Exhibition. Now, that said, yes, anyone of any age can be an emerging artist. Uh, we're not at all interested in um, excluding anybody from an opportunity. It's, it's just that we had a gap that felt like uh, could be filled in some interesting ways. So that's why we developed the program. Um, and I'm really pleased that it's our second year doing it. And um, there's just a lot of really interesting work in the exhibition. I remember my time in art school. Uh, you're just surrounded by a vibrant community of artists that are ready to explore and experiment and figure out new materials and that sort of thing. And so uh, I, I feel like the exhibition is a great representation of kind of that spirit and we're really pleased with it. So that's a little bit about the Emerging Artists Exhibition. In finding a juror for the exhibition, I wanted to reach out to, I started looking at different colleges in the area, um, in the region really and uh, different jurors that would, that would have a good take on kind of what's happening in that demographic and maybe some boundaries that are being pushed. Um, 
and have a good understanding of that sort of work and also make a, make a, make a good choice about uh, the winner that we would have for the exhibition as well. And so I reached out to Rachel Sue, and um, Rachel was great to work with. She was very timely and efficient in the jurying process, which I know can be a lot. I mean, she's sifting through 200 artworks, digital images, and only today being able to get to see them in person. Um, so that's a, that's a heavy task, but uh, I'm, I'm really excited to have Rachel here and she's going to talk to us a little bit. I'm going to read her bio really quick to you so that you know uh, that she is a vetted juror. She is established and knows what she's doing. Um, so Rachel Sue is an interdisciplinary artist who works with visual art, language, and poetry. Her work has been exhibited nationally, including Philadelphia and New York, and her writing has been published in Honey Lit Literary. She holds an MFA in sculpture from Tyler School of Art and, and Architecture and a BFA, uh, a BFA in sculpture from Western Washington University. She's originally from Seattle, Washington and is currently based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Would you give Rachel Sue a round of applause as she comes up? Thank you so much, Corey. And thank you to the Delaplaine Arts Center for inviting me. It is a deep honor to be here and to be amongst such fabulous artists and artworks. Um, never thought I would be asked to come out here, and I'm so happy I did. It's such a beautiful, beautiful space, and it's fabulous to see so many different artists represented from across the United States. So thank you so much. Um, like Corey mentioned, I'm originally from Washington State, and that comes into play in my work, um, especially in most more recent years. I am a child of immigrants, especially from Taiwan, um, and so language has become a huge part of my work, um, especially as I become reacquainted with Mandarin Chinese, which is a very directional language. Um, so every stroke, this is an example of one word, yong, which is forever um, or permanence. Um, every stroke has a name, um, and so when you're trying to explain to somebody how to write a word, you're essentially talking about the strokes and trying to piece it together. Um, it's also purely based off of memory, so if you don't remember a word, you can only ever get um, close to the meaning, like proximity. If you don't know it, you don't know it. Um, but for example, you can pick out certain parts of a word, so you can kind of say, like, it's somewhat related to water, I understand that, but the rest is kind of up in the air. Um, and so because of this idea of like um, struggling to understand language, of memory, of practice, if you're not practicing, you lose it. Um, so, for example, reading and writing have become very difficult for me now that I'm so far away um, from those I can practice with. Um, and so that's become a large part of my work. And this work, Fetch the Moon from the Seabed, Hai Di Lao Rie, which is a reimagined Chinese language learning worksheet. The pages flow from deep blue to near white, or near white to deep blue, depending on your reading direction. Um, there is no beginning and no end, or you could say that they're both beginnings and both ends, depending on which direction you're reading. Uh, different meanings and interpretations unfold depending on your reading direction. So um, I'll show you some examples of that later on, but like many of you during the shutdown, I was suddenly confronted with the impossibility of returning to the Pacific Northwest and me being the only one here on the East Coast and the rest of my family being on the West Coast. Um, I started to think about my mother who's also isolated. She's the only one from her family living in America. The rest of her family lives in Taiwan. And so growing up along the Pacific Ocean, which is the same ocean of my parents' homeland, but thousands of miles away became a really huge influence for me. And thinking about growing up in Washington State, being constantly surrounded either by mountains or by the ocean, I started to think a lot about the color blue um, and how it's the color of desire, of yearning, and of distance. Um, Rebecca Solnit, if anybody knows that writer, wrote a really beautiful essay called The Blue of Distance, in which she's talking about how, and specifically, like I was thinking about the Pacific Northwest and how these mountains in the distance are so blue, and the blue of the ocean is only blue because of its immense depths. Um, a water in a glass, for example, is translucent. And so thinking about as you approach said mountains, they become less blue. And so it's only ever something that you can achieve or see with distance. And so thinking again about proximity, about distance. Uh, 
and I know that's kind of hard to read, but thinking about, um, thinking about unpacking language and how, because I'm not a native Chinese speaker, so to, um, so to say, um, I began to kind of unravel the poetics of a language because it's not my first language. And so separately, for example, hope and thirst um, are two separate words in English, but then if you read it together from right to left, it's actually the word for desire or for yearning. And so thinking about how you can like, mix and match words and depending on your reading direction. And I specifically wanted to make these approximately the size of my torso, um, because similar to anybody who's learned a second language or a third language, it is like a very awkward, time-consuming um, task, so to speak. And you're gonna stumble over your words. And also with Chinese, it's a monosyllabic language. And so, um, I should say Mandarin is a monosyllabic language. So the tone changes the meaning, context changes meaning, the curl of your tongue changes its meaning. Um, for example, a, a beginner's um, like tongue twister, so to speak, for children, when you're learning the different tones is ma ma chi ma ma man ma 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 ma, which is the mom was riding the horse, the horse was slow, so the mom yelled at the horse. Um, but so like all of that kind of changes the meaning. Um, like, what's another one? Si is four, si is death, or shi, that's another word right there. So thinking about how you're, the way that you're curling your tongue and using your mouth changes the meaning of a word. So in an immigrant household speaking primarily Mandarin Chinese, it's like you have to pay attention, otherwise you're gonna miss something. And then thinking about the ocean again and how the ocean as a word needs to combine the words sea and foreign. Um, so thinking again about foreignness, what does it mean to navigate a space? Um, how do you p reposition yourself? And so this one meaning to wish, to miss, to think, to believe, so many different meanings, depending on its context, what, language, what word precedes or follows it. Um, so for example, if it's reading left to right in this direction, it's saying, um, like, I wish to return. This one meaning, meaning return, to circle, to answer. Um, but then right to left, it means recollection. And so thinking about how language shifts depending on which direction you're kind of coming from. And so this one would either be the beginning or the end, depending on which way you start. So it, it begins or ends with the word open. Um, and you need to get very close to it and able to decipher what it actually says. And so kind of demanding the labor that language learning requires. Um, and having, how do I translate that into a bodily experience or to make that felt in one's body? <clears throat> Excuse me. And then that kind of led to this artwork called Tending, thinking about the English word tending and how it could be tender, tending to something, attention, or tenderizing something. And so how it kind of envelops both a very loving and caring gesture, but thinking about tenderizing as a very violent gesture, and how that kind of encapsulates a lot of our experiences in thinking about the small violences that were done upon um, my childhood, for example, but uh, mostly in fear of survival. So it was out of love. And so thinking about how those two things are constantly coexisting side by side. And how do I try and translate violence, especially in the wake of Atlanta, which is what this one was in the wake of the Atlanta shootings. Um, how do I translate that emotional experience into a physical um, felt experience? And so I created this reflexology platform, which does anybody know, have anybody heard of reflexology at all? Yeah, okay. Um, in Taiwan, it's very common to find these reflexology paths of stones in public parks, um, and people are allowed to just take off their shoes and walk across it. It's supposed to generate um, good health. Um, and if anybody's tried it, it's actually quite painful, so I'm interested in thinking about how pain and healing kind of coexist side by side. Here's a really brief video just to show. Like the scale of it and how I hand washed each of these stones by hand. So I was able to feel how sharp some of them were, how flat some of them were, um, and therefore 
arrange them in accordance to where I would allow people to find respite. So the longer you were stepping on them, the more you were able to kind of tell over time like which ones you would want to step on next and able to kind of relieve your pain for a momentary, um, momentary break, so to speak. So you can kind of see this person navigating this platform. Part of it as well, which you'll see later, is a reimagined reflexology um, brochure, so to speak, when you see those. For example, if you're ever getting acupuncture, they'll have a diagram of your ear, for example, with certain points and how certain parts of your ear or your feet co correspond to your liver, to your heart. And so this became um, a poem that I kind of reimagined. And so you can kind of, it reveals three separate narratives. So on the left, there's one narrative. On the right, there's another. Um, and it matches up to the different pressure points. And then you're able to kind of create your own poems, so to speak, um, based off of the location of those reflexology points. And so it reveals um, themes that I had mentioned previously of joy and sorrow, violence and tenderness kind of coexisting side by side. Um, so for example, where does it hurt? Somewhere between heartbreak and rage. Something like fear cutting wakes into the air as you walk. How is your heart? Show me how you love me. The way my mother made me weep in front of a mirror. What are you looking at? Looking as in looking after, as in care. And so it kind of unfolds through that. And then I was kind of met with this um, interesting realization. Like anybody who is a student of history within the context of the United States is not. It's not surprising to find that racism and anti-Asian violence has always been a part of the history of this country, as well as any types of racism, to be honest. We are a country founded on death and of war. And so thinking about how we celebrate ourselves in the American English lexicon of war, and especially in the aftermath of the Atlanta shootings, I was suddenly confronted with all these people rallying together um, in a community, but then at the same time people usually um, white folks asking us to celebrate Asian excellence. And it, and it sat really uneasily in my body when people kept praising that. And I, I, over time I realized that was my uneasiness with as if human value is dependent on A, death, but dependent on excellence or superhuman ability. And so thinking about like, what about mediocrity? What about less than mediocrity? And so I created this poem called Battle of My Body. And so using the ship spell as an object that is forever out of reach, ship spells thinking about distance and oceans crossing vast distances of arriving and departing, but also traditionally used as a signal of warning of some imminent threat in the distance, um, but always unattainable. So for example, when I'm talking about the violence of American English, Things like you're blowing up, you're killing it. Um, for those of you who remember Blockbuster video, Blockbusters were essentially um, a nickname for bombs that were dropped during, I believe, World War II, and they essentially blow up entire blocks. So somehow that's worked its way into our lexicon as um, an achievement. They say, bite the bullet, we bite, red and reaching. And then kind of fi finally reaching this top of this quiet utterance, of this kind of desperation, um, is this light what I have been begging for? And so thinking about um, visibility and my apprehensions towards representation, especially in the aftermath of anything related to violence, um, sure, like being seen allows you to be celebrated, but at the same time, it also allows you to be hunted, um, which, as we all know, like with the Atlanta shootings, those are very targeted. Um, Pulse nightclub in Miami was very targeted as a queer nightclub. And so at the same time, these spaces of, of extreme love and tenderness and care are also easily targeted. So also these things kind of like coexist side by side. And then you'll see like these, these kind of themes that I'm kind of um, like delving deeper into as I'm trying to parse out these own questions for myself. 
Love If We Can Stand It was created last year. And so in the way that Tending was this much larger platform, this eight foot by eight foot platform, I was wondering this feeling that it was holding in my body, um, especially after, I remember I was coming back from the beach with some friends over the summer and it was the best day full of like love and joy and laughter. And then that same night on our way home, we caught word of this shooting that happened in South Philadelphia. And I didn't, I was like really disturbed by how nonchalant I was, like briefly disturbed and then numb. Um, in the same way that we're kind of becoming culturized to American violence. And then, so I was, I was trying to figure out my own questions with this feeling. And so what would it mean then to distill and not allow for much movement? What would it mean then to distill pain into standing as long as possible and to navigate my own body in a smaller um, square footage? And I was trying to think of a word, which I'll show later, it's, a, it's clearer in another work of art, but um, trying to think of some kind of word that expresses this just by itself. And the word I came to was the Chinese word for endure, which um, I'll, ex I'll explain later, but the top of it essentially is, the, separately it's the word for the edge of a knife, and then the bottom of the word is heart. And so it's a literal um, linguistic, illustration, so to speak, of what endurance feels like, which is like constantly holding tension in your body. And so thinking about how to live in America, in American bones, is to constantly having to endure the coexistence and possibility of real violence um, side by side with this kind of rallying community and love. And so this is a reversed, um, so this is the word I was talking about. So like this top word here is the edge of a knife, the bottom, the heart. But if you were to reverse it, because this was an installation that I did in which everything was reversed and thinking about how to relink one's sense of living, of the weight of their living um, into one's body. Uh, I was starting to research trauma responses because I was so disturbed by my own lack of response to violence. Um, and oftentimes the first thing that people will try to do is to try and relink the feeling of your body, but through movement. So how do you become really aware of the way your body moves in a space? Um, so often through Tai Chi and dance are often really good places to start, primarily because the way your body responds after constant um, confrontations with violence, so to speak, is um, uh, it numbs yourself and able to protect your body. So it's kind of a protective response. And so in the space, there were mirrors. Oh wait, I'll pause it really quick. So to actually read and experience the work, you would have to confront these um, gym mirrors. So kind of referencing again that sense of movement, of dance. Um, of Tai Chi, having to be aware and of, also of translating. So that kind of dualness that you would have to be confronted with. And then um, there was a translation happening in the space with the left and the right speakers that would be bouncing back and forth in the same way that if you are using um, like a language learning app or um, like Duolingo, for example, um, they have those sentences that you repeat. Um, but rather than um, those typical ones like which, where's the restaurant, where's the restroom, I've kind of reimagined that into also again thinking about um, how do I use the word endurance or endure within a context of violence and sorrow but also of um, love and care and tenderness. Um, so I'll play some, I won't play all of it because I don't want to take up too much of your time. Let's start with about and so each stroke has, um, has an audio. It kind of jumps back and forth between, um, I know I have to endure this a little bit longer, but I want to feel so badly the weight of my own living, jumping back to, I don't know how, what I would do if you were to disappear from my life altogether. So thinking about the, how those two things are constantly jumping back and forth. And also slippages in translation. So um, the Chinese version, 
and the English are poetic translations of one another, but not literal. Thank you so much for listening to my artist talk. Um, it's been an honor to look at all these works. And so, as you might have guessed, I think a lot about how my body reacts to things, thinking about time, thinking about the specific materials that people choose for their own artworks, um, and how the, the form and the materials really inform the concept of the work, more so than just the aesthetic form. Um, and so, for the Emerging Artist Award, I would like to announce the winner as Shea Overstone, um, who created the resume piece. Um, really beautiful, quiet, intimate piece. Um, I encourage everybody to flip through it and thinking about ideas of class and immigration, but also as you read it, it demands, it demands your time to read it. And so it's not like, um, in a way it's like this quiet, this very quiet demand for attention and time, but also it exists on its own terms, which I really appreciate. Um, and then over time, you also learn about these other people, and it's a portrait through a resume and a cover letter, for example. So you do learn about Overstone, but at the same time, you learn about her father, you learn about these people that she's lived with in England before she immigrated to America. And so it becomes almost like a miniature portrait in a window um, into these other people that you will never meet in your life. Um, and so I, that was the artwork I thought was well, well deserved for this piece. Yeah, does anybody have any questions? Were there other pieces that really spoke to you that you could talk about? Yeah, there were. It was hard. It was definitely hard to choose. Um, for example, Riley Gosnell's cyanotype piece was really quiet and beautiful. You'll kind of understand what's like a personal um, engagement with very quiet works that kind of pack a punch. Um, but also thinking about cyanotypes and the history of cyanotypes being used for um, building, like blueprints. Um, and so thinking about building, but also weaponry and also memory, because it's, cyanotypes are made through an imprint, um, so even, even like through UV. Um, but it is the imprint of the thing that used to exist on, on that sheet of paper. Um, it's hard to explain, I guess. It's like a transparency process. Um, and so I appreciate that they not only considered um, cyanotype as a history, but also um, that specific type of silk that's used, um, which is actually a silk that is common for the like, kimono. But thinking about uh, American imperialism, Japanese colonialism, and also then within the context of an American um, history. That was a very long explanation. Okay. <laughs> Are there two other examples of that? In the other room. Yes, there are other cyanotypes, but different artists. Yeah, yeah, very different takes on the same process. Yeah, and also this one um, by Zachary Simpson, thinking about um, this upward, this looking upward movement of um, like a ceiling fan, um, but also how the gilded gold is more reminiscent of like religious um, relics, so to speak, um, and so thinking about how the gilded gold um, draws, then, then makes my imagination think of like upward movement and thinking about like um, divinity in a certain type of way. Any other questions? I can't remember what you just called that. Cyanotype, like cyan, that color is cyan from that, color. yeah. Cyanotype. Is that somewhere in the family? It's actually a photographic process, and so one of the earliest cyanotype, like uh, credited photographers, was actually um, a woman who used cyanotypes as a way to gain. Um, she would take imprints of um, like flora and fauna, and she was a scientist, so she would use that to then capture as accurate as possible of the image. Mm -hmm. So it also has ties to um, science. Um, so it was kind of like this broad. Kind of use history. I'm sorry. Instead of medical illustration. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But but medical illustration in itself is a fantastic way for people to pay attention. Right. And create. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's that's, something that's interesting to know that there was another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's something nice about it being an imperfect impression 
of the thing um, rather than a direct illustration that I think is really beautiful. So, any other questions? Just because I, I came in a, a little late, so when you talk about the characters of, yes. of each direction, mm -hmm. um, you're talking about like, I just want to know if it's not that it's flipped, you're talking, I just wanted to get the reference oh. of understanding which direction right. you're like, changing it. Yeah, traditionally English, left to right, traditionally Mandarin Chinese, right to left, wow. yeah. Oh, yeah. so you're just talking about the difference between how you would how it would read if you were reading it in English direction compared to... Right, yeah, yeah, and actually like different meanings. And certain Chinese words will mean different things if two words are flipped, for example. But, but flipped how? Um, like if the, uh, say, say like a word um, like foreign and ocean, foreign ocean, foreign sea. And then if you switch sea and foreign, it would mean... Um, something different. Something different, left to right, yeah. So I, um, just, just to share, I lived in Taiwan. Um, between 89 and 91. Okay. And so I have a little bit of, and took a little bit of Mandarin. And, but I, I was just sharing it with some, somebody yesterday. Um, in fact, I'm sure I'm sharing it with you. Um, and maybe you could corroborate this, but um, the Americans see our future in front of us mm -hmm. and our past behind us, mm -hmm. but the Chinese see their past in front of them because they've been there mm -hmm. and they can see it and they see their future behind them because they don't know it yet. That's mm -hmm. at least what my friend who was, right. who knew Chinese uh -huh. or who studied it, I, I learned a little bit. Yeah, there's something about the like American myth of uh, productivity and progress, mm -hmm. I think. It's a, a forward motion, just the, the differences with forward motion. Yeah. And when I was in this uh, movement class that I had the last week, I we were walking backwards, and I find it very easy, and I mm -hmm. love it. Yeah. And I thought, oh, well, maybe I am walking into my future <laughs> yeah. from the Chinese perspective. Right, and it's, it's a bit more cyclical, um, uh -huh. and I think it has something to do, and I, I, um, I wouldn't be surprised, like, thinking about American forward movement, manifest destiny, and progress, mm -hmm. um, compared to, like, a Buddhist mm -hmm. foundation of, mm -hmm. um, of a more cyclical nature. Okay, yeah. Um, so. And kind of, like, how that incorporates itself into language too mm -hmm. um, and so things will always come and go things will disappear and there's not in the same way that like I'm more interested in the sensation of desire mm -hmm. and how now the longer I live here and when I go back to the Pacific Northwest it's like that sinking feeling of like oh this is this is not the place in my memory mm -hmm. and it's actually more beautiful in in this middle space of desire um, mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. the necessity to close that gap, of, to acquire yeah, that always, space. Always moving, but the, yeah. the neutral being rich and full. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and thinking about um, even like, foot, like the language of photography, um, I know Susan Sontag has written a lot about it, but it's like capturing, shooting, mm -hmm. like all of this like very mm -hmm. violent language around photography and kind of like containing the thing in the image. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe it's not so much about capturing the idea of it, like holding it and keeping it so much as like, can you just feel that sensation maybe? Yeah, capturing a moment. Yeah, as a possession. Instead of, uh, instead of a reality. Yeah, yeah. A moment. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your really thoughtful question. And also I'm um, thinking about like Taiwanese Mandarin is very, Chinese is very different from um, China Chinese, which was a very conscious decision that I was trying to play with. Um, Taiwanese Chinese still uses traditional Chinese. Uh, China now uses um, what they call simplified Chinese following the Cultural Revolution, which is why a lot of people like my father's side fleeing China. Um, and so again, thinking about like oceans and thinking about proximity and space, like my grandfather was not able to return to China until the 80s when they reopened. Um, as somebody who had fled, during the Cultural Revolution, but separated by the Taiwanese Strait, which is just like the sliver of ocean. Um, and so thinking about the vastness of the Pacific and also like the Taiwanese Strait separating countries and family and experiences, and how that's like shifted the entire language in a very interesting way. My, when, one of my roommates, uh, she learned, of course, Mandarin in school mm. in Taiwan, and her mother spoke Taiwanese. 
she, though, could not speak Taiwanese, but she could communicate in some form with her mother, mm -hmm. but not, yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah, and you kind of communicate through, I mean, I'm sure all of us have different experiences of this, but communicating through one's body. Um, like, we don't say I love you in Chinese very often. Actually, I don't think I've heard it in years. Like, I can't remember the last time I've heard it in Chinese. Like, it's somehow, like, too too intense, like, too strong, but they'll say it in English. Um, Chinese being, like, well, I need, but, like, I've never heard that from my parents. It's just, like, I love you. Or, um, but rather than communicating it linguistically, like, can you then communicate it with your body? And so, instead, they ask, like, have you eaten yet? What did you eat for lunch? Are you eating enough? Did you eat rice? And you're like, I didn't eat rice for dinner. And my parents are just shocked. Like, how are you full? Are you full? Are you eating okay? So everything is like through love through your body in this way. That is, or like cutting, preparing cut fruit for your children um, to eat as a form of love and nourishment that is, that maybe goes beyond linguistics. Um, and like thinking about like massage and all that kind of stuff. Um, so like care through your body. I just, I, I so appreciate, I, I come every month to see, and I was a little late and I said sorry, but I so appreciate it because it's bringing circle for me because I, I had lived in Taiwan for a little bit and so much of what you're saying, and then I went through expressive arts, feeling, because I, I always say, I feel the energy of people and I feel in my body, and so I'm thinking, oh, well that maybe even takes me back to my connection of mm. being there at the mm. time. Yeah, it's about, um, it's more, I think, about paying attention to one's bodily needs and about entering spaces in the same way that you take off your shoes when you enter a home. Like cleanliness, sure, but it's actually probably more about showing the space a type of respect in the way that it takes care of you and respect for the people that occupy that space. Um, so the first thing that you do when you enter somebody's home is to take off your shoes. So that's also already like a bodily kind of movement. Taiwanese temples also under the door, I forget what it's called, but um, instead of just like walking into the temple, there's actually like a, quite a tall piece of wood mm -hmm. by the door and that's causing you to slow down, to kind of like bend over. So it forces your whole body to kind of bow upon entering because um, you have to like step quite high over it. And so all of these things that are like worked into the architecture of a space cause your body to perform in very different ways for very different reasons. Any other questions? Yes. Um, so, we're kind of just in the same context, but like um, this, you're saying like, how can we use our body to communicate love, right? Mm. Is there a uh, value in like physical connection between each other as well? I think so. In that, uh, yeah, definitely. In the same way that, um, like, shouldering somebody's bag for somebody. That's like a kind of care. Um, one of my favorite writers, um, Ross Gay, wrote this really beautiful essay called Sharing a Bag, or he calls it essayettes because they're quite short. Um, but it was this beautiful moment that he witnessed of people sharing a bag, even though, like, holding one handle, which I've seen now that I've read this, now I'm hyper aware whenever I see it. And it's especially beautiful when that bag doesn't need to be shared. Like, it could actually be easier for one person to carry it. But it's more of like a negotiation of your weight and um, learning how the other person moves and to kind of have this tether between each other, this like physical tether, which I think is really beautiful. And so in some ways, like things that actually don't need help, but people are helping regardless, perhaps are even more beautiful than things that like you can't move this extremely heavy thing on my own, like that's out of necessity versus like helping out of care or out of love, I think. There's something more beautiful about that. About the show, um, what's your process in selecting the pieces you did from the over 200? Yeah, so uh, multiple rounds. So first round going through for me was looking at um, the aesthetics, how something um, thinking about composition, how somebody did the, like utilize the composition, utilized form, but then actually spending time with whether or not like the way, because they, they were able to submit statements um, as well. Um, not necessarily how it's written, like I don't judge based off of writing, um, but so much as like how much this was considered, like the material and the form of it was considered. 
thinking about um, like a dish is something I use a lot when I teach, like t talking about artworks like a dish. You don't want everything to coexist. Like you don't want equal amounts of salt to sugar to oil. Like you kind of have to like fine tune spices to create a really good dish. And so people who were able to kind of pinpoint and tune works um, for the concept that they were trying to go for in a way that where everything wasn't existing necessarily on the same caliber and it canceling each other out. Um, so think about like, for example, Shea Overstone's resume, like the handheld quality of it and using a very specific binding method that is like very ubiquitous to business, but then it creates more of a tension once you actually spend time with it and read it because it unveils like a much more intimate reading. So it, things that create tension, I think, are always really great works of art. Um, so people who are able to kind of push against something, like um, from far away, it might look like one thing. And then as you get closer and spend time with it, it becomes something else. Well, to the point of you just see a picture. So were there surprises when you saw it, the real piece? There were, some of them for sure, scale does a lot. Um, and also like feeling something, like sometimes you see artworks that are seem to be big for no reason, but then you see this one, which is like thinking about like landscape, um, which is supposed to be read large in your body, um, was very important to me. Um, so there were, some, there were some surprises, for example, like the shimmer of this dust, uh, which is why I wanted to come in person before I made my decision because Photos don't do things justice. Can we give it up for Rachel?